Welcome to My Life Chassidah Supplied, episode 298. This program is dedicated in loving memory of Betzal Jacobson upon his seventh yard site on Zion Udder, the seventh of Udder, dedicated by the Jacobson family. We're episode 298, so I also want to make a special announcement and request. In a few weeks from now will be the 300th episode, 300 weeks of this program. Literally, we've answered and addressed close to 10,000 questions that have arrived in our inbox, covering the entire spectrum of life. All in the context of taking chassidus and applying it to that particular challenge or issue the best possible way, sometimes direct answers, sometimes indirect. Those of you that have followed the program know what I'm talking about. If this is the first time you're following, you will, uh, I believe, be enriched by looking at the archives of these episodes. We've created a special website now, chassidusapplied.com, where you can see all the past episodes. So here's my request. This is a free program. A lot of work goes into it. Being that we're about to enter in a few weeks from now the 300th uh, episode, and of course, this is also the 70th year of the Rebbe's leadership, 100th year of the yard site from the Rebbe Rashab and the leadership of the Friedek Rebbe. So finances are vital to make this work. I would like to ask if anybody would be interested considering being a sponsor, being a pillar in helping support our program. We're asking for corporate sponsorships, or just donations in honor or in loving memory of anyone that you would like to honor, of $1,000, $3,600, those are the two options. Obviously, every donation is welcome, but specifically those, and we would love to honor, we can honor your, corporate, your company, your corporate logo, or whatever it may be, to associate with My Life City Supplied, which has helped so many people, I would even say transform so many people's lives. There'll be more details. If you're interested, please contact me directly. You can write to the chassidusupply.com. There's a forum there, but please give me your contact information or directly to me, Simon, my name, S-I-M-O-N, at meaningfullife.com. This week is a very rich and full week of activity. First of all, Zayinodr, the both the birthday and yard site of Moshe Rabbeinu. Secondly, it's Tess Adr, the 80th anniversary of when the Friedrich Rebbe came to America, Tess Adr, Tovshin, 1940. It's also, of course, Parshas Tetzave, and we also read Parsha Zohar. So there's much to cover, as well as important topics, some more sensitive, as we will discuss through this program, and those that we cannot discuss, we will discuss in future weeks. This is also an opportunity to invite you to ask your question completely confidentially and anonymously at chassidusupply.com, as well as I mentioned, view all the past archives. All these programs are downloadable as a podcast on any platform out there. And of course, the essays are also displayed in this website, the essays of the previous five years essay contest. We've just concluded the sixth annual essay contest with literally hundreds and hundreds of essays coming in, as well as a large number of creative and artistic presentations, which is the new track that we began this year. So we will be updating you. The judges have begun to review them. It's exciting. And much is going on in the most important and most, uh, most exciting venture of all, and that is bringing Chassidus alive, bringing Chassidus and applying it to our personal lives, to our collective lives, which, of course, lies at the heart of what Mashiach told the Baal Shem Tov, Yifutsu Nesach that when your wellsprings will spread outward, chutzah, will be distributed, will reach the farthest outskirts, chutzah, as the Rebbe says, She'en chutzah memeno, out there, as far out as you can reach, that's when Mashiach will come. And we believe this is a big part of our focus of what we want to accomplish. I would say it's the entire focus of our work, which is to achieve that as much as humanly possible. And I thank you again for your support and your encouragement and for the questions that come in. This cannot be possible without a partnership here. 
there's no listeners, there's no program, if there's no questions, there's no program, and of course now I'm also requesting, considering sponsoring and helping us continue this great work. So, let's begin with um, Tess Oder. We'll begin with Tess. You know, let me begin with, yes, Tess Oder, even though Zion Oder should come first, but Tess Oder, since it's the 80th year and it's closer to us in time. So what happened 80 years ago? 80 years ago, the Friedrich Rebbe, barely escaping Nazi Europe, before that escaping Soviet, the new Soviet Union, all tremendous enemies and uh, who wreaked devastation in the Jewish world, both in physical genocide, but also spiritual, complete uprooting Jewish life as it was there for thousands of years in Eastern Europe and in Russia. So 1940, the Friedrich Rebbe, leaving on a ship from Sweden, comes to the shores of America to permanently re-establish Chabad capital, the Chabad Lubavitch movement in New York. For 102 years it was in Lubavitch, from the Mittler Rebbe to the later years in 1915 of the Rebbe Rashab. In 1915, right after Simchas Tere Pasha Vayera, was the last Shabbos in Lubavitch, the Rebbe Rashab, due to World War I, left to Rostov, and there he would be in Rostov. The Friedrich Rebbe would be there as well. The Friedrich Rebbe then, after the Istalkus, a little while, a few years after the passing of the Rebbe Rashab, 100 years ago, moved to Leningrad, which was, that, what was the name then, what today is called Petersburg. Then, of course, in 1927, was arrested for his counter-revolutionary activity. In nine, the end of 1927, left Russia, the Soviet Union, moved to Poland, to Latvia, and then in 1940, middle of World War II, middle of the hell of World War II of Europe, Friedrich Rebbe came to the shores of America and establishing that America is nicht anders. America is not different. We will rebuild and regain, and even with more success, everything that we had back in the old home. That was the Friedrich Rebbe statement and declaration to the surprise of many. And yet, yes, he prevailed. In America, he said, we will build it and become a center of Torah learning, of mitzvahs, of spreading Yiddishkeit, spreading Judaism, and of course, spreading Chassidus. Today, we are 80 years later. 10 years after that, Friedrich Rebbe would be the Istalka 70 years ago, and then the Rebbe would assume leadership. So this year, Tovshin Pei, 5780, 2020, is the conclusion of many important decades, 100 years from the Rebbe Rashab's passing, and the Friedrich Rebbe is ascending to the leadership in 1920. Then 80 years from the Friedrich Rebbe's arrival to America on the 9th of other this week. And then 70 years from the Friedrich Rebbe's Estalkus and the Rebbe ascending to leadership. The Rebbe would always mark these special dates that were complete days. That says that Evan Ezra writes that a period of 10 is always a complete cycle. So when you have 10 times 7 or 10 times 8 or 10 times 10, respectively 70, 80, 100 years, it's a significant time, above all, not just to talk about it, that it's an opportunity to mark these days in action, in taking on new resolutions, in more intense commitment to the mission for which we were sent here, which is to spread Teir and Chassidus to the entire world and bring the Geula. And there's a significant watershed moment, milestone that happened this week, 80 years ago, when the Friedrich Rebbe came to America, as the Rebbe puts it, he arrived at Chatsi Kadra Tachta, which means the hemisphere, the lower hemisphere, which was called the New World, because the population of the world, especially of the world we knew, was primarily in the same hemisphere as Israel was, and Europe. Coming to America was going to the New World, to the lower hemisphere, which means a new stage in transforming and saturating and infiltrating and impacting this material world, the lower part of the world. Lower in the sense, as the Friedrich Rebbe writes in a letter to the Rebbe, in, in explaining the question he asked, why the Friedrich Rebbe, Alta Rebbe said, the mountain Tated was not, was in Chatsi Kader Elyum. This is this hemisphere, the lower hemisphere where America is. There was no mountain Tated. She says, what do you mean? Mountain Tated affected the whole world. So the Friedrich Rebbe emphasizes in a revealed fashion, this letter is printed in Tov Shen Ches, Sefer Ba'amorim Tov Shen Ches, in the Hisof, in one of the, the ends of one after the Ma'amorim, and also, of course, printed today in the Friedrich Rebbe's letters. 
that it's in a revealed way. But the fact that there was no revelation tells you that it was a darker spiritual place. And now Chassidus was coming, and Tayyid Chassidus was coming even to this darker place. And of course was successful in doing exactly that, establishing Tayyid Chassidus, a Mokr, a Merkaz, a center, that would become the central headquarters that from there would spread with Farats, the Yom of Akedim, of Safein, of Enigma, to east, west, north, and south, Chassidus and Teda all over the world, as we see today through the Shluchim and through the communities that have been built in virtually every city across this globe. So it's a special day, in the sense, a new Slav, a new stage of this work began. And now that was 80 years from then and 70 years from the Rebbe's leadership and the Fizik Rebbe's Zistalkos, what better way to honor that is by exactly doing that, finding ways, as we do here with Chassidus Supply, that each of us, in our own creative, in our own unique and personal way, whether it's on a big scale or on a small scale, to do what it takes to infiltrate, to um, penetrate, to permeate, and infuse this material world, the American world, the modern American world, which became the capital of the entire center and the largest superpower of the entire universe, with Chassidus. And this you can do in your workplace, you can do in your personal life, you can do it online, that we are bringing Chassidus even to Chatzik Kader Atachtens, exactly what the Friedrich Rebbe did when he arrived. The Rebbe would arrive a little more than a year later on Chav Ches Sivan, but that began this new stage. And this is something we need to now commemorate, but by most importantly by re-embracing and with more intensity, with more commitment, this shlichus. So that's tesnis, a tes uh, odor, I should say. Two days earlier, Zayin Odr. Zayin Odr is with Gemara tells us the birthday and the yard site of Moshe Rabbeinu, the first Rebbe of all, Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe who received Kibbal Teda Messinai, received the Teda and becomes the, 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 ba- the barrier, the, ba- the carrier of Teda from then through all the generations till this very day. So there's the Gemara, the famous Gemara regarding Purim. Haman was happy because the lots fell on Zion other the day that Haman, that Moshe was passed away. So he thought it was a bad omen for the Jewish people. Little did he know, the Gemara says, that it was also his birthday. So someone asked the question, um, how do we know Moshe Rabbeinu was born on the 7th of Adar, when the Jewish months were not organized until long after Moshe Rabbeinu lived? Okay. So first of all, the months were organized. They were just not called by these names. These are the names Sha'alu Imam Babavel. After the exile in Babel, after the destruction of the first temple. So in Babylon, they gave them names, but the names in the Torah are named by number. Cheder Sharishin is the month of Nisan, the month that the Jews left Egypt. Cheder Sheni is Ir. Cheder Shlishi is Sivan. And the month of Adar is the 11th month, is the 12th month of the year. And then it begins again with Nisan. So there is reference, it's just not with the month, the number, it's not with the name of the month, it's the number of the month. Even though in the Megillah there's already, but the Megillah, of course, is after the Churban Bayesishin. So they had names. So, number one, the months were there, and we know, I mean, Rosh Chedesh Nisan, there are things that happened, and Tezvav Nisan was when they left Egypt. We didn't call it Nisan, we called it Chedesh Hasheni, Chedesh Hadishin. So the dates were known. The Gemara, which is Teresh of Alpel, is telling us what date. It's using the name Adar, which is the name that came later, but it's using that that 12th month on the seventh day was when Moshe Rabbeinu passed away. In Chumash, it does not say it. It does speak about Aaron. Aaron's passing on the Shchedish of what month? Of the ninth month, which is the month of, I'm sorry, not the ninth month, the fifth month, the month of Av, then the fifth month, and the first day was the passing of Aaron. Other dates are mentioned. As far as Mesha, it was passed on orally, and then finally the Gemara documented it. The relevance to us, the Rebbe brings about it as this week's, this week's chapter, Parsha Tetzave, it's the only chapter after Mesha's birth you don't find his name. So some say, commentaries say, it's because it's to remind us that Mesha was missing. So his name is not mentioned. Because this is the month, this is the day, this is the week when Mesha passed away. Which seems to be a negative reason, and... Um, 
Other commentaries say that the reason is because it commemorates that one of the greatest acts, if not the greatest act, that Moshe Rabbeinu did when he said, When the Jews had built the golden calf and God wanted to destroy the Jewish people, Moshe took up their cause and said, Erase my name from this book. So to remind them, even though God, of course, forgave them and didn't have to resort to that draconian option, but to remember what Moshe did, so his name is not mentioned. Ask the Rebbe, but it seems like a negative thing. Not to mention his name was because he didn't want his name mentioned because the God was not forgiving the people. So in a classic Sicha, Simcha Steda, Tov Shemem Zayin, many people are aware of it, the Rebbe with sobbing tears, described why Rashi concludes Chumash with what? It says, In the final eulogy of Chumash, about the great man Moshe, the only one who ever spoke to God face to face, like we would speak to a friend, that it says, to all the Isis, the signs and miracles that Moshe did before the eyes of the Jewish people, says Rashi, what did he do? So, oddly, Bizarrely, Rashi says, he broke the tablets. They all saw how he broke the tablets after the golden calf, the sin of the golden calf. And God responded, thank you for breaking them. There were no other things Moshe Rabbeinu did. He took the Jews out of Egypt. Kriyas Yamsov, the parting of the sea. Matan Teda, the 40 years of traveling through the wilderness with all the events. Of all things, Messiah and Betev, we always ask to end with something positive. Brings Rashi. What does Rashi bring? One of the most tragic days in history, the 17th of Tammuz, was when the tablets were broken, and we fast on that day. So explains the Rebbe, no, this was the greatest of all things, because we saw the leadership, we saw what a true leader does. He sacrifices himself, he's ready to say, erase my name from this book. He breaks the tablets. It's not just a Sefer Teda, which itself, we are so careful even by accident, if God forbid a Torah falls to the ground, there's fasting and there's all kinds of th- measures that have to be taken. He deliberately goes and breaks the first tablets, far greater than the second ones. Why? Because he did not want the Jews to p- be punished. By breaking the tablets, Rashi says in Pasha Kisisa, next week's Pasha, that it was like tearing up the Ksuba, the marriage contract. Yes, they heard, don't have false gods, but they didn't sign the contract. They didn't receive the contract yet. That sacrifice only expressed in this dire situation. The, the exodus from Egypt, the parting of the sea, the revelation at Sinai, the other miracles, events that happened through the 40 years. Here you see the greatness. So Tetzava, on one hand, yes, it reflects on a seeming negative, negative, but it reflects on what our leader Moshe was. So the Teda is reminding us that on this day, on Zayin Adar, the week of Parsha Tetzava, we remember the essence of Moshe. Moshe was ready to give up everything. What was his essence? The people. To save them. Erase my name. So the Torah, even after the fact, when we didn't have to erase his name. We remember, on Zion Adar, we remember this sacrifice. We remember something that's even greater than the name, and that's the essence itself. So even though it did not happen, Moshe's willingness and commitment is what we honor which teaches us in Tzchidah's applied terms the lesson that we learn from a Rebbe. The Rebbe's commitment to his people, starting with Moshe Rabbeinu, the first Rebbe, is more than just being a teacher, being a guide, being an inspiration. It's complete dedication. There's no people, there's no leader. So today when we are, after Gimel Tamas, and we talk about the Rebbe, 25 years ago was Gimel Tamas, like the Uzayin Adar for Moshe Rabbeinu, Gimel Tamas for us. So what do we remember? Yes, there's a void, but that void teaches us something, that we have the strength because the Rebbe is with us. As his children are alive, he is alive. The great, the great responsibility we have is to be the arms and legs, the mouthpiece, to do the work that the Rebbe of our generation charged us with. 70 years ago when he assumed leadership, 80 years ago when the Rebbe, Friedrich Rebbe, arrived to America, and all that comes with that. So it's a complete dedication, Rebbe Chassid, a Rebbe and his people, that is this, what marks Zion Adar, that tells us what that kind of day that is. A day that marks that type of intense bond to the point that we become like one. 
Okay, now let's move. Before I go further, let me just give you some cross-reference, which I like to do, even though I know it's cumbersome for some, especially if you're listening to this on the road as a download. Um, and, uh, but nevertheless, for the complete picture, I like to cross-reference. So Tess Adr was also discussed on, in episodes 202 and 252. And um, Zion Adr is episodes 57, 103, 153, 202, and 248. But we have a few more things we want to cover regarding Tetzave and Zohar. We spoke about Tetzave, the lack of, you only say Va'ata Tetzave. Moshe has only, only spoken to us Va'ata, you don't hear his name. You, which we just discussed. And we want to talk about Zohar. Zohar Asher Osalacha Molik, that the Shabbos always before Purim. In different schedules, it's different. Uh, uh, we read Pasha Zohar. You have this chira. First, you remember Amalek and then you erase Amalek. When? When we erase Haman's name, when we read the Megillah and Purim. So, in different years, it's a different kvias. So, this Shabbos, we'll be reading Pasha Zachar. So, what, let's talk about Amalek a bit. So here's a question that came in. The story of Amalek is a very troubling one. How can it be that God says to kill men, women, and children? Because that's what it says. That all men, women, and children, Amalek should be destroyed. How is that just? Is it true that Jews went and stabbed little babies and innocent unarmed women indiscriminately? It almost sounds like an ancient Jews were, that ancient Jews were like ISIS. I'm reading it uncensored. How can this be explained? Another question. Why is remembering Amalek so important? Is it really such an important thing that we remember that we, and that we say every day the Sheish Shchiris, with the six, six remembrances at the end of the morning prayer, and read it before, on, before and on Purim? And everybody comes to Shul to listen because Shabbos Pasha, Pasha Zacher in a mitzvah for all people to listen to. Midaraisa is the only parsha that from the Torah itself is an edict that everybody should listen to. Aren't there so many more important things that we could focus on rather than killing men, women, and children, especially now that we don't know who Amalek is? And even if we did, we wouldn't kill them because we don't have the ability and because I can't imagine society would tolerate it. It would be like a holocaust. Why are we asked to commit a holocaust on a people? It is very troubling. So there's a bunch of different questions. They're good questions. And we have to understand them not just metaphorically, but also literally. And we'll talk then the lessons in our lives. So briefly, and if you want more information, I've written about this because, of course, it comes hand in hand with other questions that are related to Leisachai Kol Neshama, that when the Jews came into Israel, they were told not to leave anyone, any survivors. How does that consistent with what we so much know about shedding blood? Blood of anybody, even our enemies, we don't celebrate. So that exactly is the answer. When you look at the Torah and you look at Jewish history, you never find this to be the common approach. We always abhor, and the Torah abhors violence, war, shedding of blood, even when you have to with an enemy. Even when the Egyptians... We're drowning in the sea. And the angels began to sing praise. God says, my creatures are drowning. You're singing praise. It was never what was looked for. And it was not the standard. Tetas, tetas chesed. A tetas of love. The tetas was not given but to bring peace into the world. So suddenly you have this anomaly. Amolek. Or the one, other one I mentioned. Which I'm not going to discuss right now. So what begs the question is not how this was Allah. It's not consistent. So when you see someone who's lived his entire life, a compassionate, kind, virtuous person, Avram Avinu, who not only did not kill, he prayed for infidels, Sedeim. And then suddenly you see, out of the blue, a complete anomaly, an aberration, that told to kill men, women, and children. What's the logical approach? Something going on here. If it was a person who's a murderous person, God forbid, and you see a history of violence and bloodshed, then you're not surprised. 
But here you see a peaceful people, a people who after World War II did not go and exact vengeance on the Nazis by blowing up their cafes and killing men, women, and children with everything they did to us. Because it's not in our nature. It's not a Torah nature. And suddenly you see a Amalek, you have to say, that needs explanation. To just jump on that and say that's the norm. Just like the story with Pinchas when he's a zealot. He was a man of peace. He was a quiet, timid person. When he does something, you have to say there must be an explanation. The answer is yes, once in history, there was a nation like Nazis. And God is the one that defines that. This is a nation that will be your mortal enemy. They proved it by attacking Jews as soon as they were most vulnerable after 210 years. Imagine Jews marching out of the concentration camps. They're liberated. And a nation attacks them. At that point, people who are emaciated, people who suffered, people whose families were destroyed. It takes a particular level of cruelty to do that. Now, there were those that did it, actually. Many countries that didn't want the Jews back. But here was a nation that did that, and God designated this nation. For whatever reason God created such a nation, that's a good question. This nation will always be your enemy. So it's basically a defensive war. And even if you may show compassion, it's going to end up haunting you. Compassion was shown to the little baby Haman, and he became a Nazi, he became a Hitler. Now you say, who could know someone's going to become Hitler? God knows, that's the only one. So it's justified only for that reason as a one-time completely, a complete anomaly. Now, what does a Molech represent? It represents hatred, like the Nazis. It represents utter hatred. No redeeming quality. What does it mean in terms of our personal lives? Why do we remember this? Once it happened, it happened, fine. You know, it's sad memory. We should just erase it. We do erase it, but we're told to remember. Erase the memory. The answer is because Amalek represents psychologically one of the worst cancers. The cancer of apathy, of indifference. Why is that the worst? Because when there's a crime and there's ap- apathy, the silence is worse than the rape. Ashakor chabaderech, he cools off. You're excited and passionate? No. Amalek is also the gematria, the same numerical equivalent of doubt. If you are someone's adversary and you're against them, at least there's someone that you know here's your enemy. But if someone throws in doubts, we know doubts are the worst enemy of all. Because they demoralize you. They immobilize you. You don't know what to do. In times of war, the best thing you can do with an enemy is throw in doubts. They don't know where the enemy is. They don't know how powerful the enemy is. They don't know what direction they're coming from. They don't know what's going to happen. Because then you're psychologically weak. If you see the enemy directly and there's no doubt, so then it's a matter of who's going to be more strategic, more powerful, and so on. But if you can throw in doubts in your enemy, the enemy starts questioning, maybe I don't have the strength, maybe I don't have the confidence. That's why intelligence is so valuable in time of war. Amalek represents all of that in our lives. So the Torah tells us once a year, Zohar, Remember what Amalek did, what Amalek does to you in every generation. It's that force of apathy. And do everything possible to eliminate it. Because it is your enemy. It will not let you move forward. It will paralyze you. It will demoralize you. That's what it means in personal life. And that's why we remember it. Every aspect of it is toxic. Now, I'm going to say, I'm going to leave a little part of doubt in my mind. I'm going to leave a little apathy, a little indifference. No. Complete elimination. So when you understand it in that context, then you say, oh, you know what? This is an important lesson in life. There are things that we have to not tolerate. Zero tolerance, because they're destructive in our lives. Okay. One more question regarding the chapter Tetzave, and then we'll go to something on joy. We have uh, plenty to talk about still, and I hope I can all do it in the time allotted. So we read... In Pasha Tetzava, we read, we read, in Pasha Tetzava, we are commanded to take two sh- Shoham stones, this is Avni Shoham, and engrave on it the names of the tribes of Israel. This was the Urim Vetumim, the breastplate that the Kohen Godel had, and it was stones, called Shaham stones, certain type of stones, and engrave on them the names of the 12 tribes. 
Rashi comments that Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehud, and Don Aftali on one of the st- one side, and on the second side, God, Oshu, Yisachar, Zvul, and Yosef, and Binyamin. So the question is asking, but in other places, Menashe and Ephraim are considered progenitors and included as part of the 12 tribes. Yosef breaks into two, the son of Menashe and Ephraim. We see that when they, land in, when they end up in Israel, the division of the land. But there's nothing Joseph. Yosef is divided into two. So why are their names not included on the Shayam stones? In other words, why sometimes we include Yosef and sometimes we include his two sons? Are there 12 tribes or 13? Second question, how come the sons of Yosef get their own status as progenitors of a tribe, but for example, the son of Yehuda or Naphtali don't? Good question, which is really not just for this parsha, it's also parsha of Ayechi, which is all originates from. Yaakov Avinu, when he was brought, the last days of his life, Yosef brings his two sons to be blessed, Menashe and Ephraim. So Yaakov designates that you will become like your uncles, meaning like the other the other tribes. He gave them the status of tribes, not just children of tribes, which would be relevant, as I just mentioned, in the Chalukah Sa'adits when they would divide the land. And he also added that p- people will always bless you by Menashe and Ephraim. But that just carries over the question, why Taka? We know that's where it originates from. What's unique? And why sometimes you count Yosef, like when it comes to the, 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 the Urim Vitumim, the Avni Shem, and sometimes you don't. So there are various explanations given briefly. What was unique about Yosef that the other tribes did not have? Let's look for the uniqueness. He was thrust against his will into a place he did not want to go. The Yosef Hurad Mitzrayim. Yosef descended down to Egypt. Hurad. Not just physically, but also spiritually and psychologically. His brothers, jealous, wanted to kill him, but then they ended up throwing him in a pit, selling him into slavery, he ends up in Egypt. It would be the beginning of Golis Mitzrayim. There would be a a good period for a while. He goes down to Mitzrayim, which is one of the tragic events. Koftzal of Rigzir Shal Yosef, Yaakov losing his special child. Yosef ends up, of course, in prison, and then finally ends up being the first Jewish accountant of Petifer. Then he ends up becoming the viceroy of all of Egypt, turning it into a superpower in the grain business. Because of the great famine, Yosef oversaw the trade and commerce of the most precious commodity of the time, which was grain. Story told, all told in the Torah. And what's the Chiddush? Explained especially in Chiddush, that even though he was in Ervis Aritz, in a depraved land, in a corrupt land, he did not succumb. He remained Yosef. He remembered what he had learned with his father before he left. That was the Chiddush. So when it comes to the other tribes, they all remain shepherds like their father was, and like their grandfather and great-grandfather was. Avram Yitzhak Yank were all shepherds. Why shepherds? Because that's very conducive. The sheep graze in the field. It's not labor-intensive. And you can meditate and pray and, and, and study and connect to God. You're not in the hoo-ha of Wall Street, of the marketplace. Yosef, on the other hand, went into a place and became part of the marketplace and still maintained his spiritual integrity. Says Chassidus, that's why Tfilis Mincha, a person should always be careful by the afternoon prayer more than others. Why? Because when was Elio's prayers answered by Mincha? So Chassidus asked the question from the Seder Hayyim, a Sefer. Mincha is the prayer that doesn't have Shema, it's the shortest prayer. The morning prayer would seem to be the most precious one. The evening prayer at the end says no, because the morning and evening prayer come before work and after work. To go into the workplace and tear yourself away to pray while you're in the marketplace, in the Mitzrayim of our time, that shows your spiritual connection much deeper. That's why it's a special prayer. In the marketplace, not that you're in a koila and a yeshiva in a spiritual environment. So Yosef merited something that no other tribe merited because he showed the Yisr Er Menashe the transformation of darkness to light as indicated in the names. What's Menashe mean? From the word Nasheni, you made me forget my oppression. You made me forget my, my agony, my suffering. 
from coming here to Egypt. So Menashe helped him overcome this great challenge of being demoralized by being sold by his brothers into Golis, into slavery. And Ephraim is even deeper. Kefrani. Not only did I forget, you, we have thrived. You have thrived here, but only in the poverty of Egypt, in the darkest place. Not only have we maintained integrity, we've grown. So their names indicate the strength that the Jewish people would need that the other tribes did not offer, which is going to a darkest of place in exile and there celebrating and connecting, maintaining, the, maintaining and growing and thriving the integrity of what it means to be a Jew, what it means to be a godly person. So they were blessed with that. The question is, why then sometimes, so that's why when it came to Eretz Yisrael, when you're dividing the land, it's a real division, so Levi doesn't get land. So it's still 12 tribes, because Levi is not counted for the division of the land, but now Yosef, his two sons, Ephraim and Menashe. When it comes to other matters, because Yosef at the end of the day was one of the 12 tribes, and the language of Chassidus, they drew down, they're makafta tata, they're the lower chariot, the lower bitl. They draw down the, the, the divine energy of Atsilus into Biyah, Briyat Sirasiyah, Yosef is Yesod, He's the mashpia that draws down into Biyah, into Mitzrayim, all the way to Mitzrayim. So when it comes to the Ashpa, like uh, Urim Vetumim, which is on the breastplate of the Kohen God, well, there we go, the 12 tribes, they are the Yudbeis, Yudbeis Shifte Yudke. There you're talking about the 12 methods of drawing down the divine into a mundane existence. But when you're talking about the transformation of the mundane, Ephraim and Manasseh, which is taking the land, the land of Israel, and turning it into a divine holy land, and a promise living up to the holiness of the land, Ephraim and Manasseh are the ones that are counted. This is one of different explanations. And let's move now to, since we're in the month of Adar, the early days of the month of Adar, is it possible... Someone asked that Mishaniknas Adar Marban Besimcha has nothing to do with an infusion of spiritual energy. When other enters, we increase in joy. It has nothing to do with infusion of spiritual energy. It has more to do with the month of others starting to get warmer outside and the days getting longer. More sunshine equals more happiness. So I spoke about this last week and in different years that other every month has its energy. And other's energy is joy. So he's saying. This person says, maybe it's simply just a, uh, a, a uh, weather issue. That others, the beginning, the end of winter, beginning of spring, or going into spring. And therefore, more sunshine, more equals more happiness. Nice question. Answer is very obvious. As we know, how good for Kasha? Why Taka is that way? Why is other that month? Other, why is other not a month middle of the winter or middle of the summer? Because that's the energy of the month. That's Taka Y in this hemisphere. We're not talking about the lower like Australia and South Africa and South America. That's why other Taka becomes, because other is the energy of joy, that's why it's a warmer day. It begins the warmth. Not the other way around. That's how Chassidus explains everything. Everything has a root. What's the spiritual root of others positioning in the calendar year? Because exactly that is the month of joy, the month of Purim. That's also why Purim helped happens in other. So the way Chassidus explains all these things is it didn't happen and then we find an explanation for it. It happens in the right time, the month, and the right energy, the right spiritual environment that's conducive to positive activities. Just like of is the opposite, which brings me to the next question. There are many forms of joy. But well, the question is, what does it mean to increase joy in other? And why do we decrease joy in of? Because the statement is a double one. Just as we decrease in joy in the month of Av, the sad month when the temple was destroyed. And other negative events. Why do we increase in joy in the month? So we, we should also increase in joy. So the question is asking why. There are many forms of joy. When you hear a joke is one kind of joy. When you eat good food or win the lottery, another. When you complete a project, yet another. And when you have a child or get married or some other happy event, it is yet an entirely different kind of joy. What does it mean to increase in joy in other, and why do you decrease that joy in of? So following our discussion, there is, there are, life is cycles. It's a cycle. Times, there are times when we're closer to the source, where we feel we belong more. That's a time of more joy. There are times of distance, 
either due to exile or to other displacement, where we are feeling more distant. And you have to ride the waves. You have to navigate. Every time we need, we have to adjust ourselves to the different times. Other is a time where doors are open. And that's why Mazali gave her. It's a time when there's more intense, there's maz- mazl, mazli chazak, it says. Body mazli. The, the mazl of other is a time where it's healthy, strong luck. We don't call it luck. It means it's the energy flow is a time of a good time. That's why it has halachic implications of things you should do another if you have challenges. Of is the opposite. It's the counter, it's the alter ego of other. And what does it consist of? Because it's a sad time, that's why sad events happen. As I said, the, the energy starts first, then the events. Just like we speak about Tuba of the 15th of Av, it says that from then on, we begin to increase in learning. Is because that's the energy, and that's the energy. The sun begins to be, there's less daylight hours. That's why Yem Taber Magal, that's when they broke the axe, because the sun would dry out the wood that was used in the Beis Amigdash. Now there was more night, so it began to be more moist and there'd be more worms. And that's when they stopped, they broke the axe, meaning stopped cutting wood for the Beis Amigdash, because the spiritual energy is that. And therefore, our behavior is aligned. The healthiest thing is to align your behavior. When, for example, you're in a space where for whatever reason, things are not going so well. God forbid there's a loss in the family. Shiva. It's not bad, but it's in a time where you're supposed to be doing introspection, accountability. And then there are times of great joy. And that's how we celebrate. And that's why we celebrate. How we celebrate? So we celebrate Mesam Chilev, is Kudya Hashem Yishar Mesam Chilev through Teir and Mitzvahs. Simcha Shal Teir and Simcha Shal Mitzvah by learning, doing mitzvahs, helping others. In the month of other, there's many ways to celebrate. This, we, we schedule holiday, we schedule weddings, other simchas, and of course there's Purim, which transformed the whole month into a, into a holy, into a celebrated month. Chedesh Hashanah Av is the opposite. Not because it's a bad month, but because it's a time for introspection, it's a time for laying low, so to speak. It's like in business. There are times where you, we're not making great money, so it's a time where you maintain, you assess, you take inventory, you evaluate, and then there are times where you see there's the opportunity, that's when you go a forward thrust and you invest and you become much more engaged in the growth of the business, not just maintenance. Okay. With that, let us go now to the next question. Okay, well, this is a question that's just come up now in the last few weeks. We've all been hearing about the coronavirus. What attitude should we, should ha- should we have to the coronavirus? Yeah. So we take our cue from Taylor and from Chassidus. Obviously, it goes without saying that we have to be prudent. Any type of illness, any type of virus that can spread, we need to be wise, to be careful, both in our travel and in other ways. Protect ourselves. That's Nishmat the Meidla Nafshe Sechem. That goes without saying, but I still want to state it because sometimes it's not mentioned. On the other hand, the Jewish approach has never been panic and hysteria. You do what's prudent. You have betochen in Hashem, you have betochen and trust in God, and do what you have to do. But you don't have to go crazy. There is a panic going on. What they call it a pandemic, that it may spread all over. So we don't panic. We do what we can to contain it, and hopefully the governments of the world are doing what they need to do to contain it, because it's contagious. But to create panic, it's not, never been an approach, not in our own personal homes, or fa- uh, in our personal lives, our homes, families, or communities. People are asking what to do about Pesach, traveling to Europe, to other places. So there you have to make a prudent decision, not based on panic, based on what are the, what, what's going on, what, what are officials saying, what are doctors saying, what are professionals saying, and there's no reason to add additional risk. It's not like you must go. But again, not in a way of fear, and hysteria, but rather just make a decision, just like in any situation. You're going somewhere, you hear that that place is now, there's some dangers. This is not like what the Rebbe said about Israel, that Israel is the safest place on earth when people were wondering about attacks there and so on. This is a matter of practical matter. People who I know that are traveling to Europe or traveling to Asia or traveling to China, so you have to make decisions based on it. 
What are the odds? The odds may be low, but that's why we talk to doctors and we try to make intelligent decisions. I'm not going to make a decision for anyone because I'm not an expert. And I, either way, it's something you have to determine based on things that you talk about. But nevertheless, everything is divine providence. Everything happening has lessons in life. So what can we learn from this? So there's actually an interesting sikha. Yud Beis Tammuz, Tov Shin Yud Beis. In 1952, the Rebbe spoke about Yud Beis Tammuz. And later printed in the Kutis Sikha, volume 1, page, I believe, 150. Where he spoke about not coronavirus. He spoke about a different virus, an illness. The Enemach. And he said there that, uh, there he was answering the question. People say, why do we need to learn Chassidus today? They once didn't learn it. Chassidus talks all about Bittl, eliminating. We should always be, work on building. And the Rebbe Bram began with the Rambam, Peshmei Neprokim of the Rambam, that just like there's physical illnesses, there's spiritual illnesses. And he explained, using that one of the illnesses that has emerged in the modern age, which was back in 1952, he was referring to Yena Machla, is one that instead of something missing, many diseases, something is missing. Something lacking. In the diabetes, you're lacking insulin. Other diseases. Then there's disease where something is added. You think, what's the big thing added? But added could also cause problems, sometimes even worse problems. And the Rebbe said that the root of that type of illness is rooted in Amalek, actually, in Gaiva. He says, even though it always existed, arrogance, but today it's even greater than ever. The Rebbe didn't explain why, but it could be explained in many ways, all our comforts, all our luxuries. And arrogance is like an, it's just without reason, like that illness. It's an illness that was irrational, that suddenly something begins to spread and grow, the opposite, not lacking, not deficiency, but growth. And that's why you need to have, either Rebbe spoke about the medications necessarily, to start to eliminate the power of bitl, not the power of treating something, but trying to get rid of something that's not necessary. It's not relevant, that particular issue, but interesting from there, I take my cue, that we can learn from that, that illnesses sometimes are connected to events in our time. Now what is a virus, especially one that can spread so quickly? It spreads. It's contagious. In a negative way, as we know, a computer virus, or unfortunately also a, a medical virus, is dangerous for that reason. Because if it didn't spread, it can be easily contained. But as soon as there's a virus, people, children go to school, people travel, people meet each other different places. It spreads, whether it spreads through breath, or it spreads through uh, fluids, or it spreads through um, um, different droplets, or whatever it is that a body emits coughing, etc., etc., like in this case. This, so the negative part of a virus is the ability of something to spread and infect others. The positive side of it is that if you have a positive virus, imagine if you do good, and the good is contagious. So in our day and age, that's what we're dealing with, a technology, a technological world where things spread so quickly. Once upon a time there was no travel, many of these issues would be contained in the city or town where it happened. And we wouldn't even know about it, for that matter. Today, everything spreads quickly. Both the, both the, 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 the disease itself, an infection, God forbid, as well as information about it. So the lesson to learn is that in our day and age, we have an information revolution. But it could also be a deluge, a flood, where information overwhelms you. And your senses and sensory tools are, are inundated, are overwhelmed by what's streaming, how much is streaming. So perhaps a lesson that can be learned from the coronavirus is the idea that we should know how to measure and, and tame the information coming into our lives, the viral effects of mass information, 24-6, or those in, not in Shabbos, in not, not, those in the non-Jewish world, 24-7 stream of information that literally can overwhelm all your senses. And replace it with a powerful positive virus. To use technology, to use to send a good word, a kind word, a compassionate word. Even hearing about the coronavirus can drive you crazy. Drives you into panic and hysteria. Look what's going on. The stock market is plunging. Everybody's afraid. A pandemic, more than an epidemic, a global, a global epidemic. And that alone can cause a lot of fear and a lot of demoralization, a lot of, of uh, self-consciousness and insecurity. So we have to balance that, both for ourselves and our children, and say coronavirus, yes, but there's a lesson. 
let's use this opportunity to spread a positive virus of good news. Now, I'm not being naive. I'm not suggesting I go back to we have to be prudent about it. But everything has a deeper lesson as we learn from that. Okay. With that, let us go to, I have a bunch of other questions. I just see I'm not going to be able to get to them all. So let's, let's do with this. Let's deal with the question on Pasha's Truma. This was last week, but since it came in, let me address it. Atze Shittim. So we learned there about Hamayish Rabbeinu Vehikti Truma. God says, collect contributions from all the people. And one of the things should be Atze Shittim. Which was the word, the Keshia wood, made from cedars that would be used in building the temple. So someone writes, in the beginning of Pasha Truma, God asked for certain donations to be made to help us build the Mishkan. The sanctuary. One of the materials donated was acacia wood, called in Hebrew atzeshit. Where were, where were the Jews supposed to find acacia wood in the desert? Also, what is the connection between atzeshitim and the word shtus? Because shitim is shtus, which means either nonsense or insanity or a, uh, yeah. Is there an implication that this type of wood, when used for holy purposes, can offset folly and sin? If I make a musical instrument out of Atse Shittim, which inspires people to meditate on godliness, can that off, off, offset folly? Or only if the Atse Shittim is actually used in a Mishkin or Beis Amigdash? Thanks. So first of all, I don't believe we need my life to supply to answer these questions. Uh, at least the first one is Abba Feyre Shirashi, right at the beginning of Truma from Tanchuma, from the Medrash, that says exactly that question. Where did they find out Shittim in the wilderness? And the answer is, Yaakov Avinu saw Baruch HaKedosh, he saw that the Jews would build a Mishkan. So he brought, he brought cedar wood, Arozim, as Rashi says from Medrash, from Israel, to, planted it in Egypt, and told the Jews that when you leave, make sure you take it with you, anticipating their need for it. There are other explanations, about whether this wood grew in the wilderness, but that's the Rashi explanation. That's enough to suffice to answer that. Also, what is the connection? The connection you're asking is actually Bosiligani, Tov Shin Yud. It's a big part of the, the, the first chapters of the discourse that we just learned, Yud Shvat, especially this year being the 70 years from the Rebbe's leadership. And he says exactly that, Atzi Shittim, because he's talking about the service in the Mishkan, Karbonus. And then he speaks about Atzi Shittim that comes from the word Shtus. Transforming the Shtus, the folly, as you put it, of the animal soul into holy folly, into Shtus the Gdusha. And yes, it was done in the Beis Hamidish and the Mishkan, that, that, or the Beis, I should say the Mishkan, was done in a literal sense. And we do it through our Vedas, so absolutely we can do that. That's the whole lesson that we learn from it. That even today, when you don't actually have that wood, or let's put it this way, we're not building a Mishkan from that wood, you can learn the lesson of, of transforming the folly, offset it and transform it into something that's positive. Another question came in, which I'll just read because I tried to address all, as many questions as possible. Space of the Ark. How do you explain the idea of Mokim Odin Einamin Amida? The space of the Ark is not included in the dimensions of the Holy of Holies. That when they measured the Ark, it had, a, it had parameters and specific measurement. When they measured the room, with the ark there, it was as if there was no ark there. So the Gemara says that the space of the ark was as if it did not occupy space. How is it explained that the dimensions of the ark were larger than the room it was contained in, but yet it didn't take up any space? Was the ark a physical object? Essentially, the ark was an interface between space and beyond space. I addressed this question very directly in episodes 247 and 248, so there's no need to repeat. Please go there, and you can find it easily at chassidahsupply.com. I should also add, on the YouTube version of all these of the programs, you can, they're all time-stamped, so you can actually go exactly, directly linked to the section you're looking for in any given program. Okay. Time is of limit, as always, unfortunately, but that's what we're part of that we have to deal with, just like space. So let me go to a chassidah's question. I had some other topics I really wanted to address this week, but, you know, the question is about free will. 
how do we have free will if God is recreating the world every second in a specific way? Al Talaba brings from the Baal Shem Tov, the beginning of Shai Yechud Vamuna, that the Word of God is always there in, in the instilled, embedded in existence. It's constantly renewing the energy every second. And if one second is not renewed, existence ceases to be. So how is there room for free will? Ask this questioner. Okay, so we have, asked, we have addressed this question in the past. But briefly, let me say this. I see there's another question which I don't think I'll have the time to address. But uh, maybe I will. We'll see in a moment. Okay. This question is addressed because, number one, very simply, God himself, in his mysterious way, suspends, even though he's energizing existence, he's energizing this hand right now, but he suspends control of what this hand will do. Now it sounds like a paradox. If he's controlling my hand, if he's energizing it, then how could I use my hand to do something negative? I should only be able to give tzedakah with my hand. So he suspends how that, how that hand will be used to us. He'll give you the energy, and that's the, that's the tragedy in a way, that when you do something inappropriate, you're actually using divine energy that is sustaining and maintaining and energizing and everything it's doing to you, and you're dra- dragging that energy into something that God says you should not do. That's the power of free will. So there's a suspension, which as I said, we may not fully understand. The Rambam says... We don't understand how God knows. They're the questions about knowledge. But knowledge has already been answered as the the Raivet answers. That knowledge, you can say you could know something, but that knowledge is not affecting you, so therefore it doesn't affect your choice. But when you say it energizes you, you have to say it's more like Sevev Kalalman, that it gives you life, but it's a detached way, so you can do things that may go even counter to that energy itself. That's what Sri Bechir is. God gave the human being something unique that no one else has, the ability to choose. Now, to explain it, there are many ways you can explain it. For example, you can buy a machine that the manufacturer and the engineer told you to use a certain way. You don't use it a certain way, it's going to be destructive. Now, they're not there holding your hand, but they built the machine that way. And you start using it, you start pouring water into it where it shouldn't be water. Or you eat foods that are toxic. And you know it's toxic. We're not talking about if you don't know. And yet you can do it. So the machine has been built to do one thing and you're using it for the exact opposite. You saw this in a more grotesque and obscene way by the Nazis. Using different items to kill instead of to bring life into the world. So we see that something can be built a certain way. And it's built that way. It's built for bringing positive things into the world and it ends up being destructive because we have free will. I know it's not a complete example because they're the engineer is not God. The engineer does not energize you and your hand and the machine. Once you bought it, it's yours. The engineer is not there. The builder is not there to, to energize it. It's just an example that something can be built a certain way. And it's even conducive to be done the right way. And we can end up destroying it. Like our human bodies, you can end up ingesting and inhaling things that are destructive, even though your body will reject it. And will actually be repulsed and will react. And yet you can do it. So the point is God is allowing us to do something that defies his will. Even while he's energizing it. Now as I said, there's a longer, someone wrote a longer uh, discussion on this matter. You know what, let me read it, why not? Let's just get it dealt with. Free will versus determinism. Shalom Aleichem, Rabbi Jacobson. I'm a 20-year-old, 21-year-old bocher, and I have a question regarding free will versus determinism in Yiddishkeit. Just to preface, I'm not trying to start a debate, going back and forth in battle, and type away. I like to think I have Kabbalah Sail, which means I accept God, and I'm ready to accept a logically presented, structured argument. I do believe in free choice as a Yid. My question, or rather the idea I have, I thought of while learning Shar Yichud Vamuna. A couple of years ago, I wanted to confirm that it's taka true, what I'm about to say, hence me running it by a fellow Elter Chassid. <coughs> a Jew has free will. That the Torah tells, that's what the Torah tells us. Who is free? 
אלא מי שלמד תרא. אין לך בן חיידן אלא מי שלמד תרא. The person is not free unless the one that learns Teir. But at the same time, before a person is born, it is decided for him or her whether they will be rich or poor, smart or stupid, etc. So therefore, when a person chooses in this world to eat pizza over ice cream, or red shoes or blue shoes, he's just fulfilling a predetermined nature for which he had been born with. So how does one become free through Teir? How? To explain through a marshal, there is a maze, and man, and man is thrust into the maze. From the time he is born into this world. Now the entrance to the maze closes behind him once he enters it. And even if he wants to go back, the maze does not let him. As it happens, there is no exit for the maze once the entrance closes up behind him. So no matter how many left or right turns he takes, he is essentially, he'll essentially get nowhere. I compare this to Ilam Hazah, specifically man's nefesh abamis, man's animal soul, and nefesh alikis, and divine soul. When a person thinks that he knows best and that he'll follow after what he wants, his tivus, his desires, he's just making a bunch of left and right turns into the maze. He thinks he's going somewhere. He thinks he's the biggest rebel when realistically he's no closer to the exit or truth than from the before he decided to make the left or right turn. So the question is, how does one exit the maze? Everything is decided for man except for fear of heaven. Because his nefesh of the kiss, his divine soul, is not from this world, it's able to rise above it. Granted, it's channeled in the right way, through learning Teda and doing mitzvahs. We rise above our materialistic nature and predetermined fate, like the man in the maze. He now levitates above the walls of the maze and is just able to just stop over, just hop over and go where he pleases. He's not confined to his previous confinement. With Teda, he becomes a free man because he's not a slave to his nefesh of the kiss. Does that make sense? Do let me know if you need any clarification. All the best. So let's first of all separate some things. Free will doesn't mind, does not necessarily equate it with Ben Chayrin. Free will means you can really choose. There is a relationship that Teira allows you, and I agree with your analogy, to free yourself from the cultural and social and other mores and influences that can force you or coerce you and pressure you to conform. And be stuck in the maze. So Torah does free you. It allows you to see God's perspective, another perspective, a spiritual bird's eye view of things. So yes, I would agree with that. And exactly, I'm sorry, everything's in the hands of heaven except fear of heaven. That's up to us. But I would say the first topic I spoke about is goes further than just freeing ourselves from these trappings. It's also the actual free will that we have. And that only adds to the case, because you can then ask the question, so why does the Mishnah say that only through Teda do you become free? Everybody has free will, even if you don't learn Teda. Because Teda gives you the additional resource to free yourself from all the effects that we can be trapped in. It allows you to see another perspective. So your Teda helps you exercise your free will, if you wish. Whereas free will in general is part and parcel of existence, as we discussed. So let's now go to the essays and um, they have follow-ups, plenty to discuss, but okay. Um, the essays. So we have three essays still from year 2019. Essay number one is going beyond By Mendel Marcus, age 21, Mission Viejo, Viejo? Viejo, California, Schliach in Chicago, Mesifte. He writes, depression, a single word but with quite the baggage. Something humanity at large has been struggling with for centuries, with no sign of reprieve. Quite the contrary, there has been an alarming, alarming trend unfolding the world over. The amount of people suffering from depression recently has ballooned significantly goes on to say how different interventions have not made the problem easier. This essay will focus on one specific aspect of these issues and attempt to find a solution for this problem from a secular standpoint. And our Hasidus helps us steer clear of these issues altogether. The Hasidic sources, he quotes, used in this project are primarily the Rebbe Rashab's explanation of Eved versus Ben, Mikner Rav Samachvov, 
Tafar Samarvov, and the Rebbe, the Rebbe's revolutionary take on Kabbalah sale, Tafshin Yud. Okay, it goes on to analyze the facts, brings down what depression is, ancient Rome's solution to depression, being a servant, and application. Well, well done, very well done essay, I have to say. Thank you. This and the other essays are posted as we speak at chassidahsupply.com or if you subscribe to our programs, free subscription I should mention, you get them in your inbox. The next essay is Overcoming Peer Pressure, something we mentioned earlier. Sarah Esther Schnickler, age 15, Montreal, Canada, student in Montreal High, High Base Rivka. Do you ever feel stuck between doing what you know is right and what your peers say is right? If you look up the word pressure in the dictionary, you'll get this, the burden of physical or mental distress. Pressure can come many different ways. And though social life is a good thing, isn't it? Yet, we as a community, the Jewish people, have learned and been taught how to rise above not being trapped and controlled by others. Even though it says, Al-Tifrish Minat Sibur, that you shouldn't separate from the community, and it's important to be part of a group, but at the same time, also know how to be yourself. Goes on to speak about positive peer pressure, negative peer pressure, and what the Shulchan Aruch begins with, do not be disturbed, do not be ashamed before those that mock. Very well done essay as well, using chassidus, the different levels of embracing and appreciating the divine, and ultimately practically bringing it to a conclusion of how we can rise above being influenced by peer pressure, negative peer pressure, I should say. Okay, that's essay number two. And the third essay is Tachpeshus v'talboshat b'chsidus b'zdei ha'chinuchi v'ha therapeuti. Costumes and disguises in chsidus in the field of education and therapy. In other words, the use of disguising and costuming and camouflaging with good intentions, sometimes they have bad results. That's the theme of this discussion. And how it helps in education and in the world of therapy. It begins by explaining where you see in Chassidus the concept that concealing, how the divine is concealed, costumed, disguised. And when the reality is a deeper one once you dig, dig deeper. And how that applies itself to our lives. Interesting, very creative essay in taking that concept and turning it into a positive tool of education and communication and therapy. So, yes, that's the essential theme. Uh, uses a bunch of exercises, both visual and other forms of exercises, and a practical bulleted, uh, pr- practical rather, suggestions at the end, and very good, well-sourced as well. Another excellent essay. I, can, I continue to be amazed when I read these essays. Different people, schools of thought, different ages, different backgrounds are all using their skills and time and energy to invest in applying chassidus to real life issues. Which brings me back that we just concluded the sixth annual essay contest and creative track in the United States. The essay is still a contest is still open to Hebrew essays for a few more days. Zion others the deadline for that. And there go to diraloy.com or diraloy.org, not positive, I think diraloy.com, D-I-R-A-L-O, and you can find the, all the details about the Hebrew contest. So with this we conclude, and again I want to conclude where I began, we are about to approach the 300th episode of my life, yeah, 300, I never thought it would last that long, it would be that successful, and we're asking for your support especially in being a corporate or personal partner with us for a donation of $1,000 or $3,600 to really help us grow, not just maintain, but grow and expand this program. We are here every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. Everything can be found, all the resources at chassidahsupply.com. This has been My Life, Chassidah Supplied, episode 298. It should be a simcha, and joy in every possible way. It should be prayed together, break through all barriers, open up new channels of blessings in Bonne Chaim Zeyne Revicha, in children, in Parnosa, income, livelihood, and health, all in an expanded way. This program is brought to you by My Life, Chassidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. 
Make even a small contribution at chassidusupply.com slash donate.